Perhaps nothing was more decadent about French aristocrats before the revolution than their over-the-top meals. From simple snacks to unusual treats, get ready for 20 shocking foods that peasants enjoyed in ancient times. You'll question, what were they thinking? We've got it all on the menu. Number 20, humble pie. One of the dishes that peasants ate in ancient times was humble pie, a pastry filled with entrails and organs of deer or other animals. The word humble came from the French word nombles, which meant the edible innards of an animal. Peasants had to eat humble pie because they could not afford the finer cuts of meat or because they wanted to respect the animal and use every part of it. Hunters also enjoyed humble pie as it gave them a chance to taste the different, delicious parts of the animal. Humble pie was flavored with herbs, spices, salt, and pepper, and sometimes added with eggs, cheese, or fruit. It was cooked in an oven or over a fire, and eaten hot or cold, depending on the situation or preference. The pie was often served with bread, wine, or ale, and sometimes with other foods, such as stewed vegetables, roasted meat, or cheese. Humble pie was a hearty and nutritious meal, as the entrails and organs were full of protein, iron and vitamins, but also a challenging and acquired taste as they had a strong and unique flavor and texture. The humble pie was the source of the phrase eating humble pie, which meant to admit one's mistake or inferiority. The phrase was a play on words between humble and humble, which sounded similar but had different meanings. The phrase suggested that eating humble pie was a shameful and unpleasant experience as it was linked to poverty, low status, and poor quality. It was often used to mock or criticize someone who had to apologize or concede defeat. Number 19, roast cat. Roasted cat was a food that was made from a cat that was skinned, gutted, and cooked over a fire. Peasants sometimes ate roasted cat as they were desperate for food during times of scarcity or famine, or as they wanted to add some protein to their diet. It was also a delicacy in some regions, such as China and Korea where it was thought to have healing or arousing effects. There were several ways to prepare a roasted cat, depending on the cook's inclination or what was available. Traditionally, roasting a cat involves slaughtering it, washing it, and taking off its organs and fur. After that, the cat was roasted whole or in parts until it was soft and crispy. To improve its flavor and scent, roasted cats were frequently seasoned with salt, pepper, or other spices like ginger, garlic, or chili. In addition, roasted cats can be dried, marinated, or smoked, and added to soups, stews, and salads. Roasted cat was a nutritious and delicious food as it was high in protein, fat, and iron. Due to its pungent, musky aroma and scent, as well as its stiff, stringy texture, roasted cat was also difficult and acquired dish. Because it was viewed as filthy, harmful, or sinful by various cultures and religions, Roasted cats were also a contentious and taboo dish. Using a common yet odd item that offered both advantages and disadvantages, roasted cat was a dish that exemplified the complexity and diversity of peasant cuisine. Number 18, green cheeses. Green cheese was a cheese that was made from milk that had not been aged or cured and had a sour, crumbly, and moldy texture and taste. Peasants ate green cheese as a way of using up the milk that they could not sell or store, and also as a way of getting some protein and calcium in their diet. It was sometimes combined with other foods such as eggs, herbs, or honey to make it more palatable and nutritious. The cheese was a simple and cheap cheese to make as it did not require any special equipment or ingredients. Peasants would collect the milk from their cows, goats, or sheep and heat it in a pot over a fire. They would then add some rennet, a substance that caused the milk to curdle and separate into solid curds and liquid whey. And then they would drain the whey and press the curds into a mold or a cloth and leave it to dry for a few days or weeks. The cheese would then be ready to eat or stored in a cool, dry place for later use. Peasants frequently ate green cheese because it was a substantial, adaptable, and durable diet. You can eat green cheese by itself or with bread, butter, or fruit. In addition, it can be prepared in a variety of methods, including frying, baking, or melting, and then used to make pies, soups, and sauces. Green cheese had a strong, disagreeable flavor and smell, 
and it was sometimes covered with mold or maggots, making it difficult food to acquire. Because green cheese was thought to be a bad quality in sanitation, it was also a sign of poverty and low status. Number 17, Roasted Hedgehogs. The hedgehogs was a dish that consisted of a small, spiny mammal that lived in fields and forests. Peasants ate hedgehog as a way of surviving the winter. Peasants ate hedgehog as a way of surviving the winter, when food was hard to find and hunger was common. Hedgehog was also a way of enjoying the diversity and flavor of nature's bounty. Hedgehog was also a way of enjoying the diversity and flavor of nature's bounty, as hedgehog was considered a delicacy by some and a curiosity by others. Various methods of preparing hedgehog were used, depending on the cook's preference or what was available. Hedgehog can be baked in a pie, boiled in a pot, or roasted over a fire. It can also be seasoned with salt, pepper, or herbs. Occasionally, it can be combined with other foods like fruit, cheese, or eggs. Typically, hedgehog was eaten with bread, wine, or ale. Occasionally, it was served with other foods, including cheese, roasted meat, or stewed vegetables. Because it was high in protein, fat, and minerals, the hedgehog was a filling and healthy supper. The gamey musky flavor and scent of hedgehog required masking or appreciation, and its tough, spiny skin needed to be removed before cooking, making it another difficult and acquired feast. Since the hedgehog was thought to have magical properties that could heal conditions like rheumatism, toothaches, and baldness, it was also considered a magical and therapeutic food. The hedgehog was also connected to God of the underworld, Pluto, and the goddess of the hunt, Diana, making it a symbol of good fortune and luck. Number 16, Suckling Pig. Suckling Pig was a dish that consisted of a young pig that was killed and cooked whole, usually for special occasions or festivals. The dish is rarely eaten as it was a costly and scarce food. It was also a sign of wealth and status as it demonstrated that the owner had enough land and resources to raise pigs. The suckling pig was often served with apples, herbs, or spices to enhance its flavor and appearance. It was also accompanied by bread, wine, or ale to make it a complete and festive meal. Since the pig used to make suckling pigs was still nursing and had not received any solid food, it was very tasty and soft. Typically, the pig was killed when it was approximately six weeks old and 15 pounds in weight. After cleaning and gutting, it was then filled with fruits, spices, or herbs. Then suckling pig was cooked until its skin was crispy and golden, either over a fire or in an oven. The pig's head, tail, and feet were left whole when it was sliced and presented on a huge platter. Consumed on festive events or festivals like Christmas, Easter, or weddings, suckling pig was a communal, joyful dish. Considering it was an outstanding and abundant dish, the suckling pig was also a way to honor the hosts and guests. Because the food was influenced by many different nations and customs, including Roman, Germanic, and Islamic, suckling pig was another opportunity to savor the richness and diversity of olden times. The dish embodied the spirit and taste of archaic times. Number 15, stewed vegetables. Stewed vegetables was a dish that consisted of various vegetables that were cut and cooked in water or broth and flavored with salt, pepper, or herbs. The dish was a common food for peasants in earlier civilizations, as they could use whatever vegetables they had on hand, such as cabbage, leek, onion, carrot, turnip, or parsnip. It was cheap and a filling food, as vegetables were easy to grow, store, and transport. Stewed vegetables were also a nutritious food as vegetables were rich in vitamins, minerals, and fiber. Stewed vegetables was a simple and versatile food as it did not require any special equipment or ingredients. Peasants would collect the vegetables from their gardens, fields, or markets and wash and chop them into small pieces. They would then put the vegetables in a large pot over a fire and add water or broth and salt, pepper, or herbs. They would let the vegetables simmer until they were soft and tender, and the liquid was reduced and thickened. After that, the stewed veggies could be eaten right away or saved for later use in a cold, dry location. Eating stewed veggies every day or during times of food scarcity made them dependable and a staple diet. Since stewed vegetables kept well for a long period, they were also a great way to preserve and use up extra or damaged veggies. 
Vegetables were frequently eaten with bread, butter, or cheese. Occasionally, they were eaten with other foods, such as roasted meat, cheese, or eggs. Because stewed vegetables could be made using a variety of vegetables, depending on the season, availability, or personal inclination, the dish mirrored the diversity and versatility of peasant cuisine. Number 14, salted fish. Salted fish was a food that was made from fish that was preserved by salting and drying it, usually cod, herring, or mackerel. For peasants in ancient times, especially those living near rivers or coasts, salted fish was an essential source of protein and means of trade. You may eat salted fish raw, cooked, or rehydrated. It was also frequently accompanied with cheese, butter, or bread. Salted fish was a practical and economical food as it did not require any special equipment or ingredients. Peasants would catch the fish from the sea or the river and clean and gut them. They would then rub salt on the fish and hang them on racks or ropes to dry in the sun or the wind. The salt in the drying process would prevent the fish from spoiling and reduce their weight and volume. Salt of fish could be stored for a long time or transported to other places for sale or exchange. A tasty and adaptable dish, salted fish might be enjoyed in a variety of ways based on the eater's choice or availability. Salted fish can be served as a main meal with bread, butter, or cheese, or can be eaten raw as a snack or appetizer. Additionally, salted fish can be cooked and added to soups, stews, and pies by frying, baking, or boiling it. Another option for rehydrating salted fish is to soak it in milk or water and then turn it into paste or sauce. Due to its adaptability to many tastes and circumstances, salted fish served as a meal that demonstrated the diversity and the inventiveness of peasant cuisine. Number 13, Ophel. Ophel was a delicacy that consisted of the entrails and internal organs of animals, such as liver, kidney, heart, lung, brain, or tongue. To maximize the value of their livestock or to include some meat in their diet, peasants would consume Ophel. The dish was cooked in various ways, such as fried, boiled, or baked, and often mixed with blood, fat, or herbs to make it more tasty and nutritious. The offal was a practical and economical food, as it did not require any special equipment or ingredients. Peasants would collect the offal from their slaughtered animals, such as pigs, sheep, or cows, and wash and chop them into small pieces. They would then cook the offal in a pot over a fire or in an oven and add salt pepper, or herbs to season it. And they would also add blood, fat, or other parts of the animal, such as bones, skin, or ears to make the offal more filling and flavorful. The offal could then be eaten on its own or with bread, cheese, or butter. With its high protein, iron content, and vitamin C, B, and A content, offal was a filling and nutritious meal. Because of its powerful, distinct flavor, texture, which was soft and mushy, and stench, offal was also difficult and acquired dish. Offal was also contentious and forbidden cuisine since it was viewed by some societies and faiths as filthy, sick, or immoral. Due to its adaptability to many tastes and circumstances, offal was a meal that mirrored the complexity and diversity of peasant cuisine. Number 12, Pottage. A thick soup or stew composed with grains, lentils, vegetables, and occasional meat or fish were called pottage. Throughout the Middle Ages, pottage was the most popular meal among peasants due to its ease of preparation, low cost, and versatility. Pottage was prepared using a big pot over an open flame and its contents might be changed based on the time of year, what was in season, or personal taste. Bread, cheese, or ale were frequently consumed with pottage to make it a filling and substantial meal. Pottage was a practical and economical dish, as it did not require any special equipment or ingredients. Peasants would gather the grains, legumes, and vegetables from their fields, gardens, or markets and wash and chop them into small pieces. They would then put them in a large pot with water or broth and add salt, pepper, or herbs to season them. They would also add meat or fish if they had any, or bones, skin, or fat to make the pottage more filling and flavorful. Pottage would then simmer for hours until the ingredients were soft and blended together. Pottage could then be eaten right away or stored in a cool, dry place for later use. 
rich in fiber, protein, and carbs, as well as vitamins and minerals like calcium, iron, and C, pottage was a tasty and nutrient-dense meal. Another inventive and adaptable cuisine was pottage, which could be prepared with a variety of ingredients based on the availability, season, or personal choice. You might make pottage with beans, peas, lentils, or chickpeas, as well as barley, oats, rye, or wheat. Additionally, pottage can be prepared with beef, mutton, pork, chicken, or fish, as well as with cabbage, leek, onion, carrot, turnip, or parsnip. Because it can be made to fit any variety of tastes and occasions, pottage was a meal that was exemplified the versatility and adaptability of peasant food. Number 11. Nettle Soup Nettle soup was a dish that was made from the leaves and stems of stinging nettles, a common weed that grew in fields and forests. Peasants enjoyed nettle soup, as nettles were easy to find, free to pick, and good to eat. Iron, calcium, and vitamin C were among the many vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants found in nettles. Additionally, nettles have therapeutic properties that help with pain, inflammation, and allergies by increasing blood flow and lowering histamine levels. Traditionally, nettle soup was made with broth or water and seasoned with herbs like parsley, mint, or thyme as well as salt and pepper. In order to protect themselves from the very thin hairs on the nettles, peasants would gather them from their surroundings and cover their hands and arms with gloves or long sleeves. Nettle soup was simple and versatile dish, as it did not require any special equipment or ingredients. The nettles would then be washed and chopped and placed in a large pot with water or broth. They would bring the pot to a boil and then lower the heat and let the nettles simmer until they were soft and tender. The heat and the cooking process would deactivate the stinging hairs and make the nettles safe and edible. Nettle soup was then ready to serve or stored in a cool and dry place for later use. With its smooth, creamy texture and earthy green flavor, nettle soup was a tasty and nutritious food. Because it contained a lot of protein and fiber, nettle soup was also a hearty and fulfilling meal. Often served with bread, butter, or cheese, nettle soup was also occasionally paired with other foods such as roast pork, eggs, or cheese. Nettle soup was a dish that exemplified the versatility and diversity of peasant cooking because it was produced using a cheap, plentiful ingredient that had wide range of applications. Number 10, acorns. Peasants collected and consumed acorns, a food formed from the nuts of oak trees particularly in the fall when the food was scarce and hunger was widespread. Rich in calories, fat, and protein, acorns were a satisfying and nourishing food. However, because of their bitter tannins, which ruined their flavor and caused health problems, they were also a difficult and dangerous food. It made acorns safe and edible. They are required to undergo processing before ingestion, such as soaking, boiling, roasting, or grinding. Acorns were a useful and affordable food with simple ingredients and cooking methods. The acorns would be gathered by peasants from the nearby oak trees and they would use a stone or a knife to crack them open. Tannins would then be leached out of the acorns by soaking them in water for a few days or weeks while regularly changing the water. After that, they would either roast or boil the acorns until they were dry. The acorns would then be ground into a fine or coarse powder and used to make porridge, bread, or flour. An acorn could be prepared in a variety of ways, depending on the eater's creativity and preferences, making it highly adaptable a creative dish. This can be consumed uncooked as a quick snack or as a main entree when combined with cheese, butter, or honey. Pies, stews, and soups can be made with cooked acorns, boiling, baking, or frying them. Another way to ferment acorns is to add bacteria or yeast and turn them into vinegar or a drink. As a dish produced from a cheap, plentiful resource, they had a multitude of uses. Acorns were a good example of the diversity and adaptability of peasant cuisine. Number nine, dandelion greens. The leaves and blossoms of dandelions, a common plant that grows in gardens and fields, were used to make dandelion greens. Because dandelion greens were readily available, free to gather, and nutritious, peasants liked eating them. Vitamins A, C, K, iron, and calcium were among the many vitamins, minerals, and fibers found in dandelion greens. In addition, dandelion greens simulated the formation of bile in the liver, which helped with jaundice treatment, improved digestion, 
and blood purification. Traditionally, dandelion greens were prepared with parsley, mint, or thyme, and then consumed fresh, boiling, or sautéed. Peasants would gather the dandelion greens from their surroundings and wash and chop them into small pieces. The dandelion greens would subsequently be eaten raw as a snack or a salad or as a main course, served with bread, cheese, or butter. In addition, they would prepare the dandelion greens for use as a vegetable or herb by boiling them in broth or water or sauteing them in butter or oil. To add extra flavor and variety, they would often combine the dandelion greens and other greens like spinach, lettuce, or parsley. With this crisp, sensitive texture and bitter green flavor, dandelion greens were tasty and healthful diet. Because dandelion greens were high in protein and fiber, they were also satiating and full diet. Dandelion greens were traditionally consumed as part of a full and well-balanced meal together with other foods like roasted pork, eggs, or cheese. Because they were prepared with a cheap, plentiful material that had wide range of applications, dandelion greens were a dish that exemplified the flexibilities and adaptability of peasant cuisine. Number eight, lamprey eels. A kind of jawless fish with a long, slimy body and a circular, sucker-like mouth was used to make lamprey eels. Since lamprey eels were plentiful and simple to catch in their coastal or riverine habitats, peasants took advantage of this resource by eating them. Because lamprey eels were considered a delicacy in some cultures and traditions and a nuisance in others, they were also a means to experience the variety and flavor of ancient cuisine. Given they could attach themselves to other fish or humans and feed on their blood and flesh, lamprey eels were considered a dangerous and parasitic food source. Before being cooked, lamprey eels had to be killed with their heads chopped off and their guts removed. After that, lamprey eels were prepared in a variety of methods, including grilling over an open flame, frying in a pan, and baking in an oven. To improve flavor and lessen odor, Lamprey eels were frequently served with wine, vinegar, or spices like garlic, ginger, or pepper. The flesh of lamprey eels were moist and soft, melting in the mouth, making them a delectable and delicate dish. Because they were rich in iron, fat, and protein, lamprey eels were also a wholesome and filling meal. Bread, cheese, or butter were the typical accompaniments for lamprey eels, while they were also occasionally served with other foods, including roasted meat, stewed vegetables, or cheese. As they were prepared with a lowly and peculiar product that presented both several advantages and difficulties, lamprey eels were a dish that exemplified the diversity and intricacy of peasant cuisine. Number seven, frogs. Frogs were a food that was made from small amphibious animals that lived in ponds, lakes, or marshes. Peasants enjoyed frogs as they were easy to find, catch, and cook, especially in spring and summer when they were plentiful and active. These frogs were a nutritious and delicious food as they were rich in protein and calcium and also a delicacy in some regions such as France where they were called cuisses de grenon, frog legs. Different dishes can be prepared using frogs. Traditionally, frogs can be prepared by gutting, skinning, and frying them until they were crispy and golden. Garlic, butter, or parsley were frequently added to frog dishes to improve their flavor and scent. Additionally, frogs can be prepared by boiling, roasting, or grilling them, and then added to soups, stews, or pies. Other seasoning for frogs include salt, pepper, herbs like rosemary, sage, or thyme. Eaten on important occasions or festivals like Easter, May Day, or Midsummer, frogs were a celebratory and communal feast that brought people together. Frogs were not only a lavish and abundant dish, but also a gesture of gratitude and hospitality to the hosts and guests. Frogs were also influenced by many different cultures and traditions, such as Roman, Celtic, and Norman, and they reflected the diversity and complexity of antiquated cooking. Frogs were a delicacy that perfectly captured the flavor and essence of the Middle Ages. Number six, snails. Snails were a food that was made from small, shelled animals that lived in gardens, fields, and forests. Peasants enjoyed snails as they were easy to find, pick, and cook, especially in winter when food was hard to find and snails were dormant. Packed with protein and iron, snails were both tasty and nutritious diet. In some parts of the world, including France, where they were known as escargots, 
they are considered a delicacy. Traditionally, snails were prepared by boiling, roasting, or frying them till they were juicy and soft. Snails were prepared in a variety of ways, depending on the cook's mood or availability. To improve the taste and scent of snails, they were frequently served with garlic, butter, or herbs like parsley, thyme, or rosemary. In addition, snails can be prepared by stuffing, grilling, or stewing them, and then adding them to salads, soups, or pies. You might also season snails with salt, pepper, or other spices like clove, nutmeg, or cinnamon. Snails were a common food in olden times, especially during festive occasions, and they were influenced by various cultures and traditions. Snails were eaten by many people for their nutritional value as well for their symbolic and medicinal meanings. One dish that was popular in Europe at the time was snail pie, which was made with snails, cheese, eggs, cream, and spices baked in a pastry crust. Snail pie was a rich and satisfying meal that showcased the diversity and complexity of ancient cuisine. Number five, sparrows. Sparrows were little brown farm birds or village birds that were raised for food because sparrows were easy to discover, catch, and cook, especially in the winter when food was scarce and hunger was common. Peasants relished eating sparrows. Because they were high in protein and fat, sparrows were a tasty and nutritious diet. In certain places, like China, they were even considered a delicacy and were referred to as makwa, sparrow. There were different ways to prepare sparrows based on the cook's whim or what was available. Plucking, gutting, and roasting sparrows until they were crispy and golden was the typical cooking method. In order to improve the flavor and perfume of sparrows, they were frequently served with salt, pepper, or soy sauce. Pies, stews, and soups can all be made with sparrows by boiling, baking, or frying them. Spices like ginger, cinnamon, or honey, as well as herbs and sugar, can be used to flavor sparrows. Sparrows were a shared and joyous treat, traditionally consumed at holidays such as New Year's, Spring, or Mid-Autumn festivals. Being a bountiful and magnificent dish, the dishes made from sparrows were also a means of paying respect to the hosts and visitors. Sparrows were another way to appreciate the richness and diversity of ancient cuisine, as they were influenced by a wide range of different civilizations and customs, such as Roman, Celtic, and Chinese. Sparrows embodied the flavor and spirit of age-old cooking to a tea. Number four, blood pudding. Blood pudding was a dish prepared by mixing animal blood, typically that of pigs, lambs, or cows, with fat, cereals, spices, and herbs to make the most of their livestock or to include some meat in their diet. Peasants consume blood pudding. Rich in iron and protein, blood pudding was a tasty and nutritious dish that was considered a delicacy in some parts of the world, like Scotland, England, and Ireland, where it was referred to as blood sausage or black pudding. There were several methods for preparing blood pudding. In order to make blood pudding, the blood from the killed animals was typically collected and then combined with fats, grains, herbs, and spices like barley, oatmeal, onion, garlic, or pepper. After that, the blood pudding was put inside of casings that resembled stomachs or intestines and tied with string. Blood pudding was then prepared either by boiling, frying, or baking until it was firm and dark. The blood pudding was then cut into slices and either served immediately off the plate or refrigerated for later use. Blood pudding was a creative and adaptable dish that could be enjoyed in a variety of ways based on the eater's availability or preferences. You could eat blood pudding as a main dish or on its own with bread, butter, or cheese. Blood pudding can also be served as a side dish with fruit, vegetables, or potatoes. Another breakfast option for blood pudding might be eggs, bacon, or sausage. Because blood pudding was produced from a common yet uncommon source, they had a wide range of applications. It was a dish that mirrored the richness and complexity of peasant cuisine. Number three, pickled herring. Fish that had been preserved by salting, curing, or fermenting it, typically with vinegar, sugar, spices, and herbs, was used to make pickled herring. Pickled herring was an inexpensive, shelf-stable, and nutrient-dense diet that was popular among peasants. In Northern Europe, where pickled herring was an integral part of the food and way of life, it was particularly well-liked. Pickled herring was frequently served with bread, butter, cheese, or potatoes, and was consumed as a snack, appetizer, or main dish. 
The herring would be caught by peasants from the river or the sea. Then they would clean and gut them. The herring would then be salted, packed into barrels or jars, and seasoned with herbs including mustard, dill, and bay leaf, as well as vinegar, sugar, and spices. After that, the herring would ferment for weeks or months, becoming soft and sour. After that, pickled herring could be kept in storage for a long period or shipped to other locations for trade or sale. Pickled herring was a tasty and adaptable dish that could be enjoyed in a variety of ways based on the eater's preferences or availability. As a main meal, pickled herring could be served cold with bread, butter, or cheese. It can also be consumed as a snack or appetizer. In addition to being eaten cold, pickled herring can be reheated in a pan or pot and used in casseroles, pies, and salads. For a side dish, pickled herring goes well with potatoes, veggies, or fruit. Because pickled herring was created with a cheap, plentiful resource that had wide ranges of applications, it was a dish that exemplified the diversity and inventiveness of peasant cuisine. Number two, rats. Rats were little rodents that lived in fields, barns, and sewers and were used as food. When food was scarce or there was a famine, peasants would occasionally eat rats in order to supplement their diets with more protein. In other places like Vietnam, where it was known as chuat, rat, and prized for its flavor and texture, rat was also considered a delicacy. Rat was usually cooked by roasting, stewing, or frying it until it was crispy and tender. In order to provide a filling and fulfilling dinner, rat was frequently served with rice, noodles, or veggies. To improve the flavor and scent of the rat, it can be seasoned with salt, pepper, or other spices like garlic, ginger, or chili. Another way to prepare rat is to smoke, dry, or pickle it, then utilize this result in soups, salads, and sandwiches. Rat was incredibly tasty and nutritious diet, rich in iron, fat, and protein, a difficult and acquired delicacy. Rats had a pungent, musky flavor and scent, and the rough, hairy skin needed to be peeled off before cooking. Being viewed as filthy, harmful, or immoral by certain societies and faiths, Rats were also contentious and forbidden food. The dish exemplified the richness and diversity of peasant cooking since it was prepared using a lowly and peculiar item that presented both opportunities and difficulties. Number one, grasshoppers and insects. Grasshoppers and insects were a food that was made from small winged animals that lived in fields, forests, or gardens. Peasants enjoyed grasshoppers and insects as they were abundant, free, and nutritious and also as a snack, delicacy, or medicine. Insects and grasshoppers were high in fat, protein, and minerals, including zinc, calcium, and iron. Grasshoppers and insects can also be used topically or internally to treat illnesses like fevers, infections, and sores. It was common to roast, fry, or boil grasshoppers and insects and to season them with herbs like basil, oregano, or mint, as well as salt and pepper. Grasshoppers and insects were an easy and adaptable diet because they needed no specific tools or ingredients. The grasshoppers and other insects would be gathered by the peasants from their environment and their heads, legs, and wings removed. The insects and grasshoppers would next be cooked in a pan over a fire or in a pot with broth or water. To season them, they would additionally add herbs, salt, and pepper. Afterwards, grasshoppers and insects could be had as a main meal or on their own with bread, cheese, or butter. They could also be served as a side dish with rice, noodles, or vegetables. Insects and grasshoppers provided sustenance, but they also carried history and culture. Actually, eating insects is a long and rich tradition in many regions of the world, particularly in Oceania, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Prehistoric archaeological sites provide evidence of human eating of insects dating back thousands of years. Certain insects were regarded delicacy and safe for special occasions. Such crickets, grasshoppers, and ants, other insects like beetles, caterpillars, and locusts were necessities during hard times. And there you have it, 20 shocking foods that peasants indulged in during ancient times. Which of them surprised you most? Share your thoughts in the comments below.